Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning, church. As everybody is getting their coffee and uh, sitting down and uh, settling in, I want to encourage you today that uh, I believe that God has a pathway for us, and I think he's going to really bring in an anointed move this year. And so what I want to talk about this year. I want to talk about Jeremiah chapter uh, 12, verse 5. I want you to turn there with me if you would. Let's start there. And uh, this is the way I want to set a standard for the body of Christ today. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah is a uh, very uh, inspirational uh, Bible uh, uh, book that Jeremiah is, uh, I believe Baruch is the one that wrote Jeremiah, and it is Jeremiah expounding. He wrote part of it, Jeremiah did, but Baruch, his uh, uh, scribe, wrote the rest of it. So they shifted off uh, one to the other, and that's how the Word of God was uh, devised in this particular book. But it is one of the most um, life-moving books that is a part of my life and is something that has really established some good things for this church. This is where I uh, had really attained the vision and uh, the move of God through Jeremiah. He's the one that uh, began to speak to us about building and rebuilding. And during times that we face that are difficult, Jeremiah, even though he's called the weeping prophet, he can really establish directives for the body of Christ. Now, in verse 5, he says this, and I'm uh, right now I'm just going to read the first part of this um, fifth uh, verse. If you have run with footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? Church, um, if you're tired by the standards that you have set, how are you going to operate to the standard that God is going to set. God wants to give us standard that will invoke a fire, an anointing, a movement, and a transformation in our lives. Church, how is it that you're going to operate as a mere man if God has called you as an anointed one. When I say man, uh, you ladies know I'm referencing you as well. Amen? And so with what God is trying to, to direct us in, we need to start off, first off, as placing and laying out in the Word and in uh, a vision for the year, and a plan that we have for 2021. Now in 2021, there's going to be a new thing, not just here, but in the body of Christ. I believe I've been praying, I've been asking God, show me what it is that you have in store for us for 2021. And uh, God pretty much has put in my heart to lay out my plan, and he will direct it. Now, in doing that, this is the year 5781. That's what uh, the Jewish uh, plan is set out as. Now, when we look at 5781 and we see that, we see there are four tens in 80. And uh, that is establishing strength, but I believe that when we see that additional number, we see 
doorways of challenge and blessing. Now get this, when we see challenge coming out of the throne room of God, that, mean God, that means that God's going to stir the world. It's going to continue, church. We are still going to see a lot taking place on planet Earth. In the United States, I believe that uh, we are going to see things happen that are going to continue to push us to our knees. I believe we're going to see blessing beyond your imagination. I think that this is the time that the transfer of wealth is going to come to the laps of the children of God. Even though we see difficulty, even though we've seen the pandemic come in, we've seen all of these terrible situations come in, as a child of God, you should see blessing. Now, I know that we had a hard year. I know that a lot of us uh, didn't work. A lot of us did work. A lot of us were established. A lot of us got sick. A lot of us didn't get sick. But God does not change his position on the throne. God is not faced by the divisive uh, actions of Satan. God's not phased by the enemy. God knows the enemy. God knows his plan. He knows his directives. He knows before the enemy knows. God has established it all. And I'm believing that we're going to see supernatural activity like we've never seen before. And I think it's going to happen with this body as well. I think we are uh, substantial uh, world changers. Why do I say that? Well, in uh, my plan that I have laid out for 2021, we're going to start in January at the end on the 31st, an ordination service. We've got uh, four churches additionally that are coming under us. And uh, one of them has already been under us, but three are added. Two of them are in Hawaii, and one of them is in Aurora. And uh, I'm going to be ordaining these four shepherds, and I'm also going to be ordaining a minister. <clears throat> now, with that happening, what God is trying to tell you is that he wants you to see that he is not phased by numbers. That, that does not count with God. Matter of fact, God operates better in small numbers than he does with big numbers. And the reason he operates better in small is because then the establishment of God's power can be expressed in that small number then mankind knows that it's not man, it's God. The next thing is coming is uh, in March. On the 28th, we have the Passover period. We're going to be celebrating that. I believe God is already establishing a word in my heart in regard to that. And I already see what God's going to bring out. I'm already starting on my sermon for that. And then on the 4th of April is Easter, which is Resurrection Sunday. God has really given me some uh, established word that he is going to press upon us and tell us why the Jewish nation has been moved and established by Jesus Christ and why Jesus is Messiah and the order that has been established by the feasts of God, why they've come out, and how they all culminate into what Jesus Christ has done. That's coming in April. We have guest speakers coming throughout the year. And then in April, we're going to have our retreat. That retreat, uh, Pastor Tony has already uh, told you about, 
and there are uh, uh, several people that are going to be ministering. And in June, we're going to be outreaching. And come July, we're going to have our conference on the 14th of July. That's going to be our conference this year. So get ready. I'm planning on the double tree over off of Sheridan and the Boulder Turnpike. We'll see how that goes. Again, small numbers establish a big God. And so we're going to need all of you to join in to assist and help and do all of these things that Josie and I have talked about and that God has said in my heart, I'm really wanting to do a youth uh, uh, conference connected with our adult conference. So we will have one or two days of daytime youth um, uh, conference period uh, during that uh, conference that we've had. This will be our 11th straight conference for the year. And then after July 14th, we've got Thanksgiving week coming up. We're going to be giving out turkeys again. We're going to be establishing some things. We're also for Christmas in December on the 25th, which is a Sunday, we're going to be giving out toys and gifts to people in need. So we're really going to push uh, the church to be a blessing to the body of Christ and to the lost that are out there that need help so that they can know that there's a church on the rise that wants to bless the body and bless the people, draw souls in. We're also uh, going to see that on Wednesdays, uh, my online Wednesday service in February, I'm going to stop that. We're not going to have that online service. But in February, I'm going to start up on Tuesday nights a discipleship class. So I'm going to establish that. And if you're interested in being a disciple, uh, you need to come. But this is not going to be a, uh, a situation where you're going to come in and just learn. I'm going to put you to work. So if you want to be a disciple, you've got to learn to work as a disciple. And I want to put and press you into being who you need to be. And I want accountability from you disciples if you're interested. If you really want to learn how to be a strong disciple and how to be trained and directed, that's coming on Tuesdays in February. On Thursdays, we are still continuing Overcomers. That starts this coming Thursday. Pastor Dave uh, Garcia will be teaching for the next three weeks. And then uh, we're going to have Sister Sylvia Gonzalez. She'll be teaching for three weeks on that after Pastor Dave. And then we're going to continue with uh, Brother Thomas. He'll be uh, teaching and we're going forward from that. We are just going to make it uh, happen. And uh, Brother Thomas and I are talking about some things that will be coming. And uh, <clears throat> I just want you to know that we're not stopping that Thursday night overcomer class because you need to learn how to overcome. Amen. And it's very important that you go to that class on Thursdays at 6 p.m. this Thursday. Amen. We'll continue our men's and women's the second and third Saturdays of the month. Back here, we'll have the men's this Saturday at 10 in the morning and then the women's next Saturday at 10 in the morning. You ladies, you need to rise up and not just... Uh, uh, be a part of the body, but be a part of what's going on with that. Why some of you don't go, I don't understand. But I'm telling you that if you really want uh, to uh, establish yourself as a woman of God, you need to go to those ladies' gatherings. The Band of Brothers, and that's uh, Women of Hope. Band of Brothers, next Saturday, I expect you there, men. Uh, if you don't make it, I know, you know, I'm not... I don't point fingers and I don't sweat you and I don't make you feel like uh, 
uh, you're a bad person because you didn't show up. That's not what this is about. This is about us uh, coming in as powerhouse men. Amen. If this was our building, we'd put a moose and a deer on the wall. Because this is a man's church. Now, I know you ladies are powerhouses and you're in competition with us, but you're still ladies. You're not going to yell at me or... I'm teasing because I see some of the most anointed and voice-fearing women in the entire city of Denver in this church. Women who can prophesy, women who speak in tongues, women who uh, operate in the gifts, women who are a powerhouse anointed, women who are in charge. Amen? I'm not intimidated by a woman being in charge. I say go for it because we need both men and women moving and doing the will and work of God. Agreed, ladies? <clears throat> you agree, men? Yeah. I don't know which were the women and which were the men, but... <clears throat> Also, church, uh, we need Sunday school teachers, two of them, just two Sunday school teachers. You see this young lady right here, Priscilla? Priscilla, would you stand, please, and look towards the body? She is in charge of Sunday school. See her after church, two ladies or two men or whatever. But we need teachers. Amen? Also, Sylvia Talk. She's in the back. Sylvia, would you stand? Sylvia Talk is in charge of nursery. We need nursery workers to help Sylvia Talk out. Uh, she needs more workers. And church, the more teachers, the more Sunday school teachers, the more uh, nursery workers, the less we have to work. You understand that? Why do you think they have an army of ants? So one ant can do all the work and bring the sticks in to the ant mound? No. All of them are working so that there is not much put on just a single individual. That's why I'm pulling back and not doing all the the work that I have done in the past. I'm letting you do it. Amen? But I just want you to know that uh, on the fifth Sunday of every month, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to have it. I'm trying to come up with something that we could do special on the fifth Sunday. When we get our own building, we'll uh, do a potluck on that uh, month. There's four, uh, five Sundays in the year. This month and then uh, three other months coming. Okay? I want to put those to good use. So that's kind of the plans. Those are some of the things. And that does not eliminate what we're doing with Africa, with Japan, with Australia, with uh, other uh, cities in the United States that we're a covering of. Amen? We're still moving. And as small as we are, that would, that's what makes us so mighty. And I'm not going to be going to Africa this year. Um, I've gotten word that uh, it's best I don't go. So I'm going to hold back. But uh, I've got other cities I've got to go to this year. And we'll be having a lot of our men and disciples and, uh, and pastors and ministers uh, We'll be preaching from the pulpit this year. And we're going to see a lot of that going on, okay? So that's what we've got. And that's why I say that Jeremiah 12.5, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, listen to this, then how can you contend with horses? When I was a young man, and I was being discipled, I said it in my spirit 
that no one was going to outdo me. That wasn't bragging. That wasn't pride. It was a fire of God. God set a fire in my bosom. And he said, son, if you get tired running with these men and women, then how are you going to run with the devil? How are you going to be able to outpace him, outwork him, outdo him, outpray him, outsmart him, unless you become an anointed powerhouse man of God? So that's what I want to talk about today. There was a man named Wilberforce. Wilberforce was an anointed powerhouse man, and he had a drive in him. This drive started in his spirit in setting the slaves free. He was a politician, and in uh, 1738 or 58, he got saved. He was about 30-some years old. He got saved. God began to put on him how unfair and unjust it was that a man would be a slave. So he began to speak against slavery. He began to work, and he began to put his proof to the pudding by putting in legislation into uh, England's courts that slaves would be free. And it took him 50 years. And in uh, 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 the year, I, I can't remember, I think it was 1833, three days before Wilberforce died, they set a law in the land of England that stated that slaves are like human men and they no longer could be under the bondage of slavery. And from now on, it is against the law to own a slave in England. Three days before Wilberforce died, he saw his vision come to pass. Church, you need to learn to set vision. You need to learn what God is doing in each of us. God wants you to have vision like Wilberforce had. He had a stirring in him. And God began to move upon him about this slavery and he was so on fire for it, he gave his entire life to freeing slaves. The first period of time that you could see in Egypt, in Rome, they had slaves. And it had nothing to do with color because most of those slaves were white. And those slaves were put under bondage by men because they saw the value and the uh, financial uh, doorway as to how easy it would to have work accomplished by owning another man's soul. But church, that no longer is in operation in the world today, thank God. But because of a man like Wilberforce, they saw this change in England. Then we understand that I think it was in uh, the 1870s that uh, Abraham Lincoln might have been in the 50s. I can't remember, but he set down the Emancipation Proclamation to free men from bondage and slavery. And church, regardless of when that was, we do know that a man had stirring in his heart that this is not right. And now we come to today's time. There are a lot of things going on in the world. We understand that all of these things that are taking place have been an unfair an improper action against the church. The churches have been shut down in America. No more. That we have, uh, thank God we have this place that has treated us so well. 
If we had a building church, we wouldn't be able to be in it. But because of what they have allowed, we have had our services. And we have been careful with uh, the COVID. We know that some you just aren't going to avoid it. But I believe that it's a purpose set by Satan himself that COVID was brought to where it's at today. It has brought mankind to fear. It has brought them to such a fear that uh, they uh, are, are doing things that are out of the ordinary. And it's improper. But what we have to do as children of God is we must be wise. Because if you get it, it's not an easy thing to deal with. It's dangerous. And it's not a good thing to have. And I do not fault anybody that doesn't come to church because of it. But the point that I'm trying to bring to you is the enemy, he wants to put such a fear in our spirit that he wants to stop us from going forward and doing the work of God. But we must be smarter and we must move stronger and wiser and more insightful to overcome these fears. I want you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 14. Church, I want you to know that men have always had this fire such as Wilberforce had. And in Joshua 14, 6 through 12, I want to read that. Now, this story that I'm about to read is a fire that came into a man's life. Now, I want you to follow with me. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is, who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. That's Joshua 6. We know what took place during that time. We understand that Joshua came in, and what he did is he brought the children of Israel in a most unusual circumstance to cause them to do something that was out of the ordinary. What was that? To walk around a city, to walk with the Ark of the Covenant, to let the enemy know that as crazy as it seems, they're going to do what God has called them to do. But as we go to chapter 14, we see that God begins to not only stir something up in Joshua and in Moses and doing all these things that they've done prior to this, but there was one man whose name was Caleb. And I want you to listen to what Caleb began to express. Nevertheless, my brethren, who went up with me the, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. That's Caleb. Caleb goes to Joshua. He tells him, look, Joshua, we know that there was a promise made to me. And that promise was that you told me I would have a choice of land. And you told me that God promised this to me. And now I want to remind you of who I am and what has gone on in my life. This church is where you need to remind the devil what's gone on with you and what God has promised in your life. God's promised you something. God will not hold back his promise. His promise is yes and amen. And he goes on to say, Nevertheless, my brethren, who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. 
Caleb told Joshua, look, these other guys chickened out, the 10 of them. But you and I, Joshua, didn't. We trusted God and told him, we can take the land. And he goes on to say, so Moses saw on that day, saying, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, then these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke his word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, now here I am this day, 85 years old. Some people will say, Pastor, you're old. One of the children asked me when it was my birthday last week, how old are you, Pastor? And I said, I, I think I'm 67. I don't know. And he says, he began to think about it, and he went walking away, scratching his head. He needed to take his shoes off to count how old I was. But church, if I'm 67, which I'm not sure if I am, I could be younger. That's not going to stop me from doing what God has called me to do. I'm not afraid to march on. I'm not afraid to work. I'm not afraid to run with the horses. Are you? Will you run with me with the horses? Because I'm telling you, church, this is the year that we are going to see the jubilee of the Lord come forth. What does that mean? I believe it's blessing. I believe God's going to move in a great way. We'll talk more about that in another sermon. But verse 11 says, As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain for which the Lord has spoken in that day. For you heard that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I will be able to drive them out. The Lord said, and Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephthah, as an inheritance. So Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Church, what I want you to understand is Hebron was occupied by the Anakim. Those were the giants. Caleb didn't just want a hill. He wanted the hill that the giants were on. He seen his vision. God had placed in him. Here he is. He was 45 when they went in to the promised land and came out and said, we can take the land. And he was 85 years old, 40 years later, going back in the land as an old man. And he said, I'm as strong as when the promise was given me as I am today. And I want you to give me Hebron. I know there's giants there, but I am not fazed by all of the fault that people would lay on me, by the lie that someone would try to place on me. I am not afraid. I will go forward and do the work of the Lord, regardless of the devils that are sent against us. This must be our call and heartbeat. You cannot be afraid, church. You must see what God has in store for you. In Isaiah 61, verse 6, he tells us what the call of God is. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. He's talking to you. 
There's no uh, individual that is short in this. He's called you the priests of the Lord, men and women. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. What does that mean? That means that the lost will, will come against you, that the lost will speak against you, that the lost will have no answer, but you as a priest of God will give them answer, and you will say, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. That's your calling, church. When Josie and I came in, and after we had started the church, for a while, we began to ask God, God, what's our purpose? What's our, our calling? Who are we as a church? And God tell, told me in Psalms 2.8, he said, ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And we were small in number, maybe 10 at that time, maybe 20 or 30. I don't know, but I do know that God has been good to his promise. He has caused us to inherit the nations. That's why we are helping in Africa. That's why we are touching churches all over the country churches all over the world because God is good to his promise. I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Church, you need to find out what's your called scripture. What is it that's inside of you that God is trying to bust out that you may take the promise of God and say, as for this house, God, we're going Going to serve the Lord. And what about the rest of us, church? As Josie and I continued on, said, what more is there for us, God? Who are we as a body of believers? And God told me immediately, he said, you're a servant. And Josie gave me this scripture, Matthew chapter 20, verse 8. And it says, the son of man came not to serve, but to be served. Not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And we've taken that church. We're servants. It's all over this body. And there are many that are still at home because of COVID. They're, uh, they're being isolated. That's okay. But they're still with us, church. They're calling us all the time. Not just those that are a part of this body that aren't here today. They're always contacting us because some of them, they can't come around any possibility of getting sick because they may very well die. But that is okay. There's coming a day of reward and a breakthrough day coming into the United States. We're not going to be caught up and intimidated by this COVID. We're not going to allow the politicians to tell us how to live our lives. We're not going to stand up with what they're trying to put on us, but we're going to go forward and do what God is putting upon us, putting in our hearts to march forward. And he goes on to say in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, about the call of a man and a woman of God. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with the horses? And if the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? We trust in our homes. We trust in our jobs. We trust in our finances. We trust if we trust in those things. And that is what we're hoping and holding on to. 
then what happens if it's all washed away? Are you still going to trust the Almighty? If the devil has come against you, will you still trust God? Church, I know we will. I trust it, I believe it, and I stand on it. Isaiah 40, 31, as I come near the end, can you run and not be weary and walk and not faint, church? Can you? Listen. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So if you're waiting on God, church, God is going to place in you a new stirring, a new fire, a new anointing, a new blessing. And he says this, they who mount up shall mount up with wings like eagles. Church, do you know what an eagle does when there is a paraquin or another type of bird on its back? There are birds that attach to an eagle. But you know how that eagle rids itself of these little birds that get upon it. That eagle begins to flap his wings. And as he does, he goes high, higher, higher, and higher. He gets to such a height that that bird cannot continue to breathe oxygen. But the eagle will keep going up and that bird eventually will fall off its back and begin to plummet to the earth until it attains or retains its oxygen again. Church, this is you. You're an eagle. You're an eagle. I, I cannot say it enough. God is calling you back, Tara. You're an eagle. I get so sick and tired of watching some of you not take back what God has called you to be. Church, God's called you more than just a worker. God's called you more than just someone who is just existing. I'm telling you, God is trying to push you higher. And I'm talking to you, Melissa. I'm talking to you, Nathan. I'm talking to you, Israel. I'm talking to you, Thomas. I'm talking to you, Pastor Dave, Pastor Benny. I'm talking to you that God has made you an eagle and you act like a sparrow. You too, Richard. I'm telling you, church, we're coming into a time where we are preparing for the new thing that God's about to bring to us. And we will move forward as eagles. We will not let the pest of lies, the pest of depression, the pest of anger, the pest of sin to ride on our backs anymore. We will soar like eagles. We will go higher, Angela. We will go higher, Valentine, than we've ever gone before. Do you hear that? And he says this, they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. What he's saying here, church, to us is that you will be a runner and when it comes time to slow down, you're not going to stop walking. You are going to press and press and press and press until God begins to establish your calling, your anointing, and your life, Roman, your life, Tony, your life, Josh. All of you, God is going to cause 
a new thing to come to pass. He's bringing it to you, Caesar. Do you know why you get attacked so much? You know why? Because you're an eagle. You, don't kid yourself, church. We're always being overwhelmed with attack. But where we are as eagles, we must continue to soar. God is saying to us, enough, enough, enough. Do you hear me, church? 1 Peter 5.8 says it best in closing. We know that scripture once I quote it. But we know that we must be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. You hear that? He's not an advocate. He's an adversary. He's against you. He's trying to destroy you. He's trying to stop your call, Tony Ornelas. He's trying to stop you. He's trying to slow you down by putting those uh, little birds on the back of your eagle life. And God is saying enough. He's saying this is the beginning of a new thing. 2021 shall come in with a new movement, a new authority, a new anointing, a new breakthrough. For this is the year of the eagles. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, you know what vigilance is, church? That means getting up at night and praying. That means getting up and not being satisfied. That means walking your house. That's what a disciple does. That's what a child of God is doing, church. They are vigilant and they are not giving up. They are not giving in. They are moving forward. And that even goes for you, Thomas. God has placed a calling in your life. And you have held back with what it is that God has really called you to be. And God's doing a new stirring in you, brother. I, when I minute you walked in, I saw leadership. I saw authority. But I also know that you have a lot of birds on your back, brother. And you must begin to pray more again. You used to be a warrior of prayer. You used to read your Bible. You were voracious at reading it. You ate it up, Thomas, until somehow, some way, the devil hit you and discouraged you. And you lost sight of what you are and who you are. It's time, brother. It's time for all of us. Me too. It's time for me. And he says this, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know what? As I look out upon this body, I see good lunches. You guys are very tasty to the devil. He says, hmm. And I'd like to have me some rose. Eat that thing up and, and swallow it whole. Oh, I'd love to eat up Priscilla and destroy what I, God's wanting to do in her life. But you know what? God says, be vigilant. He's saying, keep a candle open. Keep it lit, Priscilla. Because God... Ah, oh, there's new things coming your way. You too, Pastor Dave. Art, get ready. Pastor Roman, get ready. Pastor Gabe, he's not here, but he needs to get ready. Amen? I want us to stand in closing. Because I believe that God wants to do something special in your life.